Uh, a primary source is different from a secondary source in that uh, the secondary sources are books or articles that historians have written about events or people that happened in the past. And a primary source is a document or a text that actually comes from the historical event or period that you are studying. So historians use a combination of uh, primary documents and secondary documents in order to construct our visions, our reimaginings of what happened in the past. If you ask me why uh, an historian uh, should or really I would say must use primary sources uh, for a serious historical research, uh, fundamentally it's, it really is an effort to let uh, the people you're writing about speak for themselves. There are lots of different primary sources, lots of different kinds of primary sources. Uh, the kind that we probably use the most, particularly in history classes, would be a primary document. So, for example, you could read a book written by an historian about the writing of the Constitution, or you could read the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, and those would constitute primary documents that are about the Constitution. Um, and so that kind of document that is, um, you know, it's more straightforward, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of writing that comes from the time is probably the most common. We use published documents from the time period. We used unpublished uh, letters, uh, diaries, memoirs. Um, anything that you can find that, that is written from the period we would call a primary document and we would use lots of those. Many of these documents are found in archives. Some of those archives are public, some of them are private. Um, accessing good primary documents is absolutely vital to the work of any historian. But there are other kinds of primary documents as well. You can consider a text to be all, either uh, the kind of document that I was just describing, uh, so a newspaper article, or a memoir, or a diary, or a letter. Or you could also think of a primary document as being a different kind of text. So you could in fact look at an image taken from a particular period. Or you could even look at um, a, a song from a particular period, and that could count also as a, as a primary text, um, even though it's not necessarily a document in the sense that the, the Declaration of Independence is a, is a primary document. There are also uh, kinds of primary sources that are more quantitative. So instead of necessarily studying a particular text, you might want to look at, uh, for example, census data from a given period. Um, whereas I think uh, if you were to talk to, say, a 19th century European historian, they have so much paper, they have so much stuff that you, that you can be a little more like, well, you know, these are the types of material that you look for when you're doing, you know, you're a historian and you're doing research. This is the type of evidence that you privilege. Medieval historians often don't have that luxury. Uh, depending on what you're studying, there are a lot of primary documents that are available online. Uh, we're grateful to a number of libraries and archives who have made their documents public um, in that way. I'm, what I'm really excited about is the opportunity for um, students to engage with medieval manuscripts earlier in their interest and career in, in medieval history. Um, I didn't actually lay hands on a manuscript um, until I was in graduate school and really didn't get an opportunity to study them much at all um, until I was literally starting my PhD. Sometimes the primary documents can be published uh, in book form as well and you'll find them in libraries. You can find anthologies of documents that have to do with a particular historical period, uh, place and time. Um, but a lot of that information has recently been, uh, been put online and so you can find those documents as well. But if you really need the document and there is something to coming into contact physically with the, with the document as an artifact from the past, then you do typically have to travel to the archive wherever it is. It's the challenge that we that the internet presents, which is access to information is no longer the issue, curating information is critical. 
the ability to evaluate and figure out to determine what's good what's useful information what's not useful what's good quality what's bad quality where is this coming from um, how close it is is it to the original you know sort of the originating source in the history department at Carthage we use primary documents in every class it's one of the things that you as a history student need to be comfortable with need to become comfortable with using historical documents they can be quite challenging depending on the period and the place um, the language can be very different um, and it can be difficult for a, a college undergraduate student to use a document, but we feel that it is very important. Uh, and for me, therefore, to uh, uh, study, to use primary sources is an attempt to uh, let uh, a, a previous generation come to life uh, and let them speak for themselves. And the value of that ultimately for us, for any people at any point in history, for each generation, the value in letting previous generations speak for themselves is that we're much more likely to learn from them if we try to do that. If all we do is talk about what we think about them, that may be interesting to us, or we may be reflecting our own views and values of our own particular time, but it doesn't really say very much about the people themselves. In other words, we are learning more about ourselves than we are about them if all we do is just talk about them. But if we try, try to wash our minds clean, have a ta tabula rasa there appear and a blank slate, and, and then do serious uh, investigation of uh, the material left over by them, and try to begin to piece all of those little pieces of the puzzle together to make a, a story, to make a pattern, to answer the questions we're asking about them, uh, we're much more likely to learn from them.